You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Thank you very much for finding the time to join this INCJ roundtable discussion. And I'm going to ask Rob Watson, uh, who's uh, been part of this project right from the beginning, to uh, explain uh, why we're here and also what method we're going to be using this afternoon. So thanks, Rob. Would you like to take that away? Thanks, John. Um, thank you, everybody. You'll have to forgive me. I'm kind of looking at three or four different open windows at the same time and, and keeping an eye that making sure everything's working. So, But we seem to be streaming and we seem to have everybody who's uh, uh, come in on, on via the Eventbrite in, invitation as well. So that's worked and that's reassuring to know. And it's we've had a real challenge. It's been fascinating through this last two years of how we've learned to adapt and use uh, things like teleconference and like this in order to be able to, uh, if not replace, but supplement uh, our engagement across the world. And that's been you know part of the excitement of working on this project and working with everybody here is how we've embraced this forms of technology. And I, I, I kind of have a, I hope my role in this has been um, uh, useful in the sense that I come from a community media background, so I've got absolutely nothing to do with criminal justice other than it's a fascinating topic. Um, but the it's interesting to talk with colleagues and now being connected with the uh, Insights team at uh, 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 the UK Prison Service and how we've developed and engendered a community feel with our communications. And it's about discussion and conversation and engagement with one another. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds to facilitate and put that in place. And it is different from uh, some of maybe our uh, inherited, learnt expectations of media. So I'm hoping we've pushed things on a, a, a nudge, a, a small bit, in order to be able to help us to come together in a way which allows us to uh, enhance our collaboration and exchange ideas, transfer knowledge and wisdom, and to to get to know each other, even though we are often distant. And I think these technologies have really come into their own, through, you know, through the through the through the, the lockdowns and the pandemic. Um, I've added to the, and I can add it again if it's not come up in your feed, but um, I put a paper which I've, uh, I'm working on a project which is about public engagement for research using community radio. And I'll just, um, oh, where's it gone? <laughs> I had it up a second ago and it's disappeared now. Uh, let me see if I can open it because uh, there's a, a statement and it, it, I went to, I it helped out to do some evaluation for this and it was about how researchers were learning to use community radio, which is often thought of as a kind of fairly, in the UK, as a fairly parochial notice board with hobbyists, often to use the phrase men in sheds, who uh, have an interest in 1970s prog rock music. Uh, but it's more than that. It's much more interactive and it's much more creative. And the statement that I like is that, you know, it's about people's lives. And it's about the different types of conversations and how these conversations can be captured, recorded and shared. Uh, so for me, we are opening up the process of engagement and discussion. And we, I always think now uh, it's a shame to leave a good conversation in the room. We should record it. Now, unless there's a good reason to protect somebody's integrity, data, security, uh, all those safeguard and reasons that we're all familiar with and to protect other people that might be affected uh, by any of those issues, particularly acutely with criminal justice practices uh, and systems. Let's get into the habit of sharing our expertise and opening up the box of how this works. It's no longer a closed black box, but we can use podcasts and we can use uh, uh, Zoom sessions like this for conversations to open this up. So I hope it becomes a much more deliberative, conversational exploration of ideas where we are able to listen to one another uh, and respond. And if you don't get your point across in this session, there's always another session that we can do. So we, we're not going to run, the internet's not going to run out of storage space and capacity because we've not said everything we want to say. Let's keep the ball rolling and 
keep it on a regular basis that we've got these conversations going on. Uh, how, how does that sound? That was kind of a, a whistle stop tour. Uh, and if there's any, any conversations, what are two things I would just before have a look at, uh, we're hashtagging this session on Twitter with INCJ discussion. Yeah. And I'll put that in the chat in a second. And the other thing that we've got is we've set up a discussion email list, uh, which you can find on the, and I'll put a link to it in the chat box as well. Uh, it's a, a JISC mail managed list. So it's a secure list, uh, which JISC is an academic system for email systems. Uh, but we've got a discussion uh, email list on there and I'll put the details of how you can keep the conversation going afterwards after these sessions uh, through email at least over to you well thank you Rob and thank you very much for taking us um, uh, through the well backgrounds of, of this session and the ideas which um, I think are very thrilling but at the same time perhaps challenging as um, in new um, times we are trying to find a way to get together online, even in an open discussion, or even if we have met yet so far, some of us and some of us um, do know each other. Nevertheless, I think it's good. Um, I've been asked by, by, by John and Rob to uh, convene this session, um, and I'm, I'm very happy and, and, and honored to, to be put in this position and to take you through a, a number of questions um, for the session. But before we start, I think it's good to share who we are and um, uh, who's participating. Some of you already mentioned or present themselves in the chat. Thank you very well. Um, but perhaps it's interesting to start with not only your introduction, but why actually uh, you would like to so um, if I could give the floor to somebody, or if I rather perhaps say, uh, is there anybody who would like to start? And if not, I'll find another way for a small introduction of yourself and um, the why for participating in, um, in this session, if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Gabriel, can I start with you or? So <clears throat> I'm uh, Gabriel Wancha. Uh, I'm uh, the chief of uh, Bucharest Probation Service from Romania. And also I'm an uh, associate uh, lecturer to social uh, sociology and social work faculty from, from Bucharest. So uh, for me being a manager, the as the answer regarding the importance of training and uh, on uh, skills and so on in probation uh, it's uh, quite uh, very it's very simple uh, because um, uh, the training give to the the offer to the, the staff the opportunity to um, have a very uh, good professional relation for with uh, probationer, for example, uh, the, the, an adequate training uh, offered uh, an increased autonomy in their professional activity, uh, increase uh, their uh, is uh, increasing their uh, capacity to um, take. Uh, uh, decisions uh, uh, not only on uh, issues regarding the relation with the offender, but, but also in other aspects uh, which uh, regarding the probation activity, for example, the relation with courts, probation institution, community institu institution from community, uh, so on. So uh, for me, a very well train staff uh, is uh, it's reflected on me for example in a very in an easy life in my organization sounds so, like a uh, perfect motivation yeah yes yes <laughs> so um, and i understand i understood the importance of training 
uh, in uh, 2014, for example, what means to have a very uh, well-trained staff, for example, uh, very autonomous in uh, their activity when uh, penal code uh, was changed. And uh, the, this change, um, imagine that uh, on a Friday evening, I heard from news that uh, starting with Monday, the new penal code uh, will enter into force because uh, the government uh, refused to postpone. Uh, it was uh, so long sto- history of postponement uh, previously. So the government said, no, we first, with 1st of February 2014, we, uh, the new penal code will in- enter into force. And um, this uh, new penal code uh, had a dramatic impact, uh, a very huge impact on probation system. Uh, yeah. we, uh, we, we must to carry new activities uh, in uh, new procedures. Uh, these procedures uh, was uh, insufficient designed by laws, so on. And uh, if we, if I passed, uh, and uh, the proba- Romanian probation system passed, uh, let's say quite uh, good on this very, uh, very hard, harsh period was uh, because the staff uh, was was very well trained. Okay. So uh, it's a beautiful example. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. It makes perfect sense the way you're uh, presenting it. Um, Thank you. I just pass on to um, Don John. Okay, um, I say good afternoon from Nigeria here. Um, I'm happy to be here again. I'm Professor Don John Omale, a professor of criminology at the Federal University of Wukari in Taraba State. Um, I'm an academic uh, at the same time a practitioner because I've worked before I joined the, the university system I worked with the prison service and disengaged from the prison service as assistant commissioner of prisons. So up to date, I, uh, my background still go along with, because with, like we say, we say, once an officer, you are always an officer. So um, joining this uh, hub is of interest to me because in Nigeria, one, criminology as a discipline is an evolving uh, discipline, it's just coming up. Uh, because before now, what we do have here is conventional psychology, sociology, and so on. But of recent, we now have undergraduate degree programs in criminology, which is an evolving discipline, trying to break away from sociology and psychology. So that's, there's that huge uh, gap for people who are criminologists to be able to help us develop curriculum in criminology that will be in line with uh, global practice. That is one in the academic. Secondly, at the professional level, the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019 now mainstream the use of non-custodial uh, services in the law. Before now, it is the traditional prison, jail, open lock, and do a kind of rehabilitation and uh, reformation training, a vocational training for prisoners within the prison. But in 2019, there is a new law called the Nigerian Correctional Service Act that changed the name from Nigerian Prison to Nigerian Correctional Service. And the law also now makes provisions for the use of probation, restorative justice, community service, and, and, so, uh, and so on and so forth as non-custodial measures. So these uh, are actually new innovations for Nigeria. Unlike you in the in the West and the low uh, countries that have been used to the practice of probation, community service, restorative justice measures, and so on, we are currently uh, encountering this for the first time. 
So there's that huge opening for what is probation? How do we do probation? How do we run community service? What is the difference between community service and probation service? And uh, how do you mainstream restorative practices with a non-custodial uh, service? So this is a huge area and gap that needs training. And if Nigeria must be part of the global community, then we need to join the global community to learn and practice like them. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. John. Um, as, as I saw in the chat, um, John stating uh, in a reaction to your a huge domain for training, actually, a huge demand as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, Ross. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I'm a uh, Ros Morrison, and I'm a senior lecturer and program leader um, at De Montfort University. And um, we are currently delivering probation officer training um, to candidates across England and Wales. And um, my interest and my background is in probation. I worked in probation for many years. So someone said once a probation officer, always probation officer really yeah. inside. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, my interest is, uh, is obviously around um, probation officer training um, and also not only training uh, in terms of the professional qualification, which is what we're delivering mostly, but I'm also interested in um, training post-qualifying, um, training of people that work within uh, the probation service, pre-qualifying, and actually thinking about what, what is it that makes training good? What do we need in training in order to equip um, practitioners to work well, um, frontline practitioners? managers and senior managers as well so yeah i'm interested in in impactful training what, what do we need to do what, what do we need to identify that we know works well um for people working in uh, across this sector and i'm really pleased to hear about nigeria in terms of <laughs> i wondered it was a question really i've asked afterwards how it was received by the practitioners this kind of different way of working um but we can get into that um, later so yeah Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dave, could I ask you? I suppose my particular interest is the um, is the connection between training and practice. I think that over the years that we've discovered the um, the most effective um training and learning takes place um so let's not call it training let's call it learning learning takes place um when um people um engage um engage very much themselves um that um the a pedagogy which is one of um, self-discovery and discovering issues for themselves um, brings out the most effective learning. And one of my concerns has been that over the years, the practice of um, criminal justice and in particular probation, but also I think youth justice as well, has, um, has moved away um from um engaging with offenders to um to solve their problems for themselves um to the application of um expert um expert diagnoses of what the problems are and um and techniques to um to engage offenders to uh, to deal with uh, with problems in ways that are led by um, by their supervisors, um, 
So I would like to, my, my interest is how what we know is best for, um, is best for trainees translates into what is best practice for working with offenders themselves. And I suppose the bridging term that I'm very committed to would be, um, and I think that these I think these terms tend to uh, tend to be fashionable. Um, the fashionable term at the moment is is co-production, and co-production embedded in trauma-led practice, um, which doesn't seem to be a lot different from um, the, um, the, val the the value system that I've engaged in and explored, which was called empowerment. Um, and I think empowerment was um, was was very much rooted in thinking about desistance and the development of social capital, um, and the engagement of offenders with um, the inf influences influences in their communities around them. So, um, wandering a little bit at the end there, but. That that's that that that's what I'm interested in, in, interested in. How do we work with offenders as partners, rather than sub, rather than objects? Thank you, Dave. That's a challenging one as well. Working with offenders as partners, and another challenging one that you stated in the start in the beginning is uh, the difference between learning and training, or whether rather training or learning. But, um, also a very interesting one. Even if you're mirroring the client um, and the probation together, is it a question of learning or is it a question of training? No, thank you. Um, Jane Dominic, could I hand it over to you? Um, yes, you can. Thank so, you. Um, I think a couple of things as I've been listening to people. One is about, um, for me, some of the challenges about who gets to say what the content of training and education for probation staff should be. And I'd be interested to hear about how this works outside of England and Wales. But in England and Wales, I think there's the, we, there's one big employer of probation staff. They, that employer very much wants to set the curriculum for training. So I think there are questions for those of us who work outside of that organisation about how to influence um, what we think it is that probation staff need to know. Um, that's one point. And then I think the other point is that, um, although I've spent a lot of my working life, uh, like lots of people on this call, involved with training people to become qualified probation officers, I am also interested in um, continuing professional development for probation staff who want to develop their um, experience and skill in particular areas of practice or find ways of integrating research alongside their practice. And, and so I think I'm, I'm also interested in a very broad view of what sort of opportunity for learning and development is useful for staff at all stages of, of their career. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, it's a challenging one as well. The uh, perpetual training in life, actually, huh? of one's, um, in one's profession. Thank you. Josef, could I hand over to you? Okay. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Josef Chatlos Dima, and I'm a Romanian probation counselor uh, working in Timish County Probation Service in the west of the country. Since the beginning of the probation system in Romania, it's been more than 20 years. Um, uh, also, I'm an individual member of CEP, uh, European Confederation for Probation. Nice to see 
uh, Jerry here in this meeting. Um, and um, I just uh, finished a seven and a half hour meeting about radicalization organized from the European Council. So I just by a little bit <laughs> tired. But uh, uh, I am always interested in, in what is new in, in, in the field of probation, in our practice. How can I improve my activity? How can I share uh, the experience with my colleagues? Uh, so I, I, I try to, to never miss this type of activities about uh, training and probation and news. So uh, glad to be here with you this evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Yosef. And good to have you with us. Um, and, and Romania so well represented as well. Uh, so thank you. Um, let's have a look, Shinet. Hi. Hi. So I, I'm Sinead Dylan. I'm based in Belfast. Um, I'm interested in this area where you actually come from, solutions. Uh, and we're looking to understand how technology can help in this space, both for the um, practitioners and for the actual probationers themselves. Um, and so it's great to have the opportunity to hear and understand what the challenges are and how maybe technology can be useful in that. It's an evolving space. COVID has had impact on that. How is that going to change? How is it going to look forward? So that's my area. And I'm joined by a colleague today. Sarah, who is just new to the company. So um, just, just to let you know that we're, we're here just to um, understand and listen and, and uh, learn about how this impact of training and education, because we recognize, you know, core systems is a, a system provider for both prisons and the probation services. So from, you know, self-service uh, opportunities to help with the rehabilitation uh, and take them on their journey and, and give um, in-cell education opportunities for any uh, any jurisdiction, any correction sector, but it's also knowing the value and what it is and also how we, we bring that into the prison and into the probationers' hands and also for the staff to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to you and to Sarah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's have a look because um, Mike... Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, Mike McGuire. I'm, I'm, I've, um, I'm, I'm retired, but I'm, I'm still quite active. Uh, I'm at the University of South Wales in uh, uh, just in north of Cardiff. I've been a researcher pretty well all my life, and a lot of it has been on probation, prisons, resettlement sort of thing in the last 20 years. I'm I'm here because I, I, did, I knew nothing about this particular organization or, or anything, but I, I spotted the, the word uh, training. And um, I've just recently been asked by a probation service in Wales to have a look at some of the training they're doing in quite uh, training of, of existing probation officers and others working with them in some quite experimental ways of working as uh, in probation, following, uh, as you probably know, most people here know the history of uh, probation over the last 10 years, which uh, is just recovering from a, a failed experiment. And uh, some of the some of the words already mentioned, like co-production and assistance and so on, uh, increasing engagement, getting, getting probation officers to work, develop relationships much better with people uh, and, and so on, uh, are, are becoming um, sort of coming to the fore in... And, and, and what, what I've been asked to do is to look at the training they're developing to, to train uh, probation officers in, in improving their, their ways of engaging with people and so on. And of course, although I've done a lot of research, I've never actually researched um, training. How do you research whether training is being effective or not? And that's what, that's what I'm primarily interested in here. Um, what sort of methods are best? Do you do it by observing? Do you do it by interviewing people? Do you try and test what they've learned or what they've re retained? Or, uh, or do you observe their later practice and see if it is actually translated into later practice? So uh, I'm particularly interested in what Ros was talking about and Jane and others. Um, but my, my fundamental question is, 
what is the what is the best way of finding out whether your training is having an effect or not? And people who are experienced in that, I'd be very interested in connecting with and uh, and, and picking their brains a bit. Okay, so, thank uh, you very much, Mike. Um, thank you, uh, John. Thank you. You just mentioned that um, uh, Jerry has got. Um, a little hand up, but I don't see it. So uh, uh, thank you for warning me. And um, perhaps I could ask Gary to come in. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to join in really to suggest I'm Jerry McNally. I'm the president of CEP and I'm a assistant director in the probation service in Ireland. And I think familiar face to some of you around the table. Um, and I see John waving at me. <laughs> so, nostalgia. But uh, I think the training is a key pr issue at the moment for CEP. And you, you know yourself that we uh, uh, began a, an education and training network within CEP, which was rudely interrupted by COVID. And uh, we're hoping that we're, re we're meeting again in uh, Barcelona in July to actually. Uh, re-energize and redirect that the purpose of that whole idea is that we recognize the importance not just of training but of lifelong education and training in in probation work because and again if you think when i joined the service in the 1970s practice was quite a lot different than it is now and if we don't keep learning we actually don't work. So I think it's this whole purpose of encouraging and developing learning. But I think CEP takes it on a wider perspective. It's not just in one jurisdiction we need to learn. We need to learn with each other and from each other across as wide a plane as possible. And I think this is where there's a particular synergy with this group, because it's not confined to any one uh, region or particular way of working, but it's much broader. So it's this whole idea of mutual learning or learning together, sharing the learning and exchanging the learning. Because uh, we learn not just what works, but we also learn what doesn't work. And I think uh, that's one of the great challenges in life is stopping doing what doesn't work. <laughs> because, again, uh, the classic thing of uh, it doesn't work the first time, so we do it again and again and again, and it continues not to work. <laughs> so, again, it's about this whole experience of learning in probation and exchanging in probation. So certainly from the CEP perspective, we welcome every forum and every opportunity to promote education and training and joint working together in probation to actually improve practice but it's to improve outcomes for the communities and for the people we work with but i think we need to do more of these kind of meetings but we need participation of people here also in groups like the cep education and training network because we're emphasizing network because we don't want to have it as just a talking shop, but we want it to be working all the time. Again, sharing, pooling, and uh, kind of telling each other what works. So I think certainly every best wish to this initiative. I think it's a very good idea, and I certainly would offer any support CEP can to keep it going and to, to inform that. Well, thank you, Jerry, because that's a very strong call together with John Chong on a need for training, actually. And um, it's very interesting to hear you talking about as well the uh, lifelong learning. Um, and nevertheless, I, I think I'll just continue because we started as a how to get to meet people and know who's at the table. And there's still some people I think um, um, I would like, really would like to give the opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, Pedro, could you take on? Would you like to join or? Moreira, Pedro Moreira. Oh. I'm not sure whether, uh, Rob, if you get any signs that People have difficulties to enter or whatever, please help me out because I don't immediately see all the things that happen. Yeah, there's I, I, probably the ones people who've got the cameras on are probably the best people to, to just okay. pick from. I think, Thank you. A good way. Yeah. Well, then, 
uh, Stefan, if I'm pronouncing right, and then afterwards um, D to Goose, but Stefan first. Yes, is that me? Um, yeah. Stephen. Yes, yeah, Steve. Yeah. Steven, sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. I'm just checking the names to make sure. Yeah. I, uh, yes, I, I, and I put my camera on, so that that was a kind of cue that yeah, I'm, there was I'm my about, cue. about ready to <laughs> <laughs> to join in. Yeah. I, I just had a few days off, so I've just come in, and my plane was delayed. So, uh, you know, I'm just sort of getting getting back into um, uh, back into our our, sub, our subject. But I'm very pleased to be here, and. Um, yeah, my name's Steve Pitts, and I I, I know um, uh, several people around the table. It's very nice, uh, very nice to hi there. Yeah, very nice to to, to see you again. Um, uh, I I'm I mean I, I follow I follow uh, Jerry. Um, I mean in terms of timing, um, but also I I think in in terms of picking up some of the things that Jerry was was saying, and uh, I I act as a CEP ambassador. Um, amongst other, amongst other, amongst other things, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very. For me, the international angle is 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 really so uh, so important here, and it's what attracts me to um, to join to join your meeting. And I, I've been working internationally for for a long time, and currently, in terms of training, specifically training, I, I'm working with a few countries, with the Council of Europe and with the United United Nations on probation probation training. And I, I think Jerry's Jerry's point is is so um, correct that you know it's about learning learning from from each other and build building an understanding of training. But also for me, I, I think perhaps another point, putting training in the context of um, what else is going on in um, in a service in a in an, in an organisation and. Um, I mean, very interesting listening to what Mike Mike McGuire had to say there about um, about research. And as one of, one or two people around the table will know, I'm I'm involved in some research into capacity building um, at the moment, which I uh, it's taking us a while, but it, it, you know it's so so interesting. And within that, of course, training is an important part of capacity building. In, in fact. Some people just equate. I see training and capacity building. I, I don't, but 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 I, I think some people do when they speak about capacity building. They mean training, but that does indicate how how important it is. But it seems to me that training is is often you know an, an essential but insufficient part really of of building strength, building building um, effectiveness, impact, and so on with with organisations. And from an international point of view. It depends a lot on um, also on on culture, on the organisation itself, on the resources an organisation has, on communications, on, on what stakeholders think about the organisation and how they how they're reacting, what stage of development a probation service um, might be at. You know, they're all also such important important points. And then the whole thing about how how we, if I mean, if I can just for a moment equate training and capacity building. Make that link. You know how how we go about it. What what is the the kind of value base really un, underpinning um, underpinning um, international um, justice justice assistance? You know, um, what kind of approaches uh, seem seem right and work best? And um, if I just add one more one more point before I before I I, I stop, uh, also to pick up on the technology points and the. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's, it, 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 I, I can say that in, in Kenya, we, 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 um, we've been working for quite a long time now, developing training programs. And then we had the pandemic, which interrupted the, the delivery, um, totally delayed everything. And we've switched to, um, to, to mainly, um, mainly e-learning uh, format, but also um, a kind of hybrid, really, maybe two thirds on online and and one third face to face, and I, I think it's tremendous. I I I I really think it's gone very very well, uh, and you know we haven't evaluated that, but we, I guess we will. I mean, at least um, we, we we will have some forms of evaluation. It's not quite, I think, what Mike was was getting at, but that also is 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 so um, so interesting. So there's a number a number of points. Um, from me, <laughs> and um, yeah, looking forward to 
to the discussion. And I, I, as I say, I mean, like Jerry said, you know, I think it's a, really, really attracted by the international aspect of this and, and, the, yeah. uh, and the exchange that that allows us to have. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve, because your, your ambitions are great <laughs> in that sense. Um, and, and especially I think about test building uh, research on how that works and it has already been expressed and I think there are some themes are coming up. But let me, before getting into um, other questions, uh, Dee, uh, you just mentioned in the chat as well that you were uh, able to join us and giving a small introduction of yourself and why. Work out why my camera wouldn't work. I had the screen save on. Hello, I'm Di from uh, DMU. Um, actually, the irony is um, I'm actually on research leave at the minute working on a tech project. So this is the woman that can't even open a screen to show you that I am here. Um, so I was listening with interest what people were talking about. It's um, a project. It's an immersive panorama. So it's a 3D digital project looking at um, indicators of domestic abuse and trying to focus on um, how we can use that as a safe place of learning. So in England and Wales, um, the policing inspections and some probation inspections have said um, practitioners don't do too well in terms of assessing domestic abuse. So um, we're currently looking at that. So preliminary findings only. But the main thing that I'm really interested in, and it um, touches with what a lot of people um, have been talking about, is I'm actually an Associate Professor for Teaching and Learning at De Montfort Uni. Um, and we've got some money for a research project. It's in two parts. We've only got the first one funded. Um, but we're actually looking at um, like neophyte practitioners, so student practitioners, right from when they first think about applying, what is it that makes them think about they'd like a career? We're focusing on a probation example in community justice, and we want to take the full project right through induction, reinduction to outduction to eventually what happens um, when they're out in practice, what happens CPD-wise, do people stay? Uh, um, is it still regarded as a lifelong job? So we've got the funding for the first part of project where actually we've just recruited, we're just about to start data collection and we actually, um, there's lots of things going around in HE uh, generally now about student engagement and all of the buzzwords that are being used. And it's kind of like Dave touched on a nerve by using the term um, empowerment, you know, when we... It, we, it's, it's almost like we seem to go around in circles. And one of the things that really struck me was um, we seem to talk about um, experts by experience or, you know, um, why don't we use students as researchers to research students? So actually, it's a student engaged project that we are doing. So we're just about to train the students in the research methods to actually get the data. So they're criminology students. We'll pay them and they're just about to get the data from um that still sounds like using people as uh, um uh objects doesn't it um that are uh, practicing uh in practice but also students so i think that's quite an interesting um anomaly there but i'm really with jane on the the idea of i'm really interested in not just happens while what what happens while they're at university um, but what happens um, in the years to come? Um, so I'm really interested in all of that sort of stuff. Anyway, I'll turn my mic off now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Di. <laughs> oh, well, um, Rob, I've got the impression you've got a little hand. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yup. I've learned a lot from this. Uh, some really, really interesting observations already. And Thank you all very much indeed. Um, yes, I'm Rob Canton. I work at De Montfort University. I know many of you, and it's great to see some old friends as well as to, to meet, meet some new ones. Um, just a couple of points, if I may. If you, when Mike asked the terribly important question about how we know whether the training we do is as good as it could be, one of the ways in which you can do this is to ask managers about whether staff are arriving able to do what's expected of them. 
But that's interesting because managers sometimes have wholly unrealistic expectations of that. And how people subsequently perform in their work depends on far more than the training that they've had. And I've been involved in probation training for many years and I've often had managers turn around and say, oh, well, look, you don't train them very well because they don't know how to do one, two, three. And the answer is often that there is no support to do that, that the workloads are unmanageable, that they're not guided in the way that they should, they're not given supervision. And the most that introductory training can do is produce practitioners that are ready to learn rather than ones that are immediately competent, or sorry, not competent, but immediately able to function as their more experienced colleagues can. I think Gabriel made an excellent point earlier on, a very good example, things change so even if you say, well, look, here is someone who is really, really competent, they can do exactly what you want, very soon the job will be different. The world changes around. So, and, um, and Gabriel gave an excellent example of how quickly that can happen. So you need practitioners who can learn how to learn and respond to uh, those changing circumstances and sometimes lead them. I think we should also consider about where learning takes place. So should work... Does learning take place in the workplace alongside experienced colleagues? Of course it does. Can and should it take place in higher education? And certain kinds of learning can usefully take place there. And we're often talking to our students uh, at university about how to blend those two things so that learning and practice are mutually informative. And I think the only final point I'd want to make, which I don't think is often raised enough, is everything is everything um, that probation officers need to do the task, the kind of thing that can be taught? For ex a particular example here, I think many people recognise the importance of emotional literacy in working with, with people in distress. Can that be taught? It, are there perhaps personal qualities that, uh, that can be nurtured but not implanted altogether if they, they don't exist already and what the implications that might be for selection um, and recruitment? So the, the limits and capacity, the limits of training or education, because Dave is right, learning is a much better word, I think, than training. Um, that, I think, is something else to explore. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very fruitful comment already. And I think that's very helpful as well, that people sort of start already trying to comment each other's uh, contributions. It's very helpful, I think, in building up uh, who we are or what we would like to do in this um, section. Um, there's some people who haven't been introduced yet. So I think I just mentioned you, Anne Burrell. Yes, thank you. Um, I currently work as a practice teacher assessor with trainee probation officers in an office based in Oxfordshire. Um, and I'm also studying with uh, De Montfort University. So seeing that role from two different perspectives in a way, I was really interested in the points that Rob was making. And the things that I think are particularly critical for probation training in England and Wales currently I think people have already referred to the very complex and messy few years we've had in probation. We're just coming up to our first anniversary of reintegration as a national organisation as part of the UK civil service, which brings its own challenges as well as opportunities. And one of the things that is currently being worked out in that is what kind of organisational culture do we need to have? Do we need to create to enable probation practitioners to work effectively and to retain probation practitioners? There's been a huge amount of, because of the private semi-privatisation, a lot of experience, qualified practitioners left and and were subsequently replaced by probation service officer grade practitioners who may be very skilled but are not given formal training that develops their knowledge and expertise. That's a real tension for the service at the moment alongside organisational culture. The people on the probation officer training programme, the PQIP, I think in 15 months or 21 months, the programme achieves an enormous amount. What concerns me is the dissonance for the trainees between their experience on the programme and their actual experience in their 
practice environments. And it seems to me that one of the current gaps is the time and opportunity to apply what they have learned on their professional training to their practice because of the demands of the role and because of the fact that people are routinely working well in excess of their capacity. So there's a whole lot of issues around what are we training people to do? How do we support them in develop in becoming skilled and confident practitioners? And then how do we retain them? Thank you. Um, that sounds very interesting. And, and especially if you're talking about organizational culture, it touches very much as well on, on the idea of training versus learning, actually. huh? Uh, is it just about training or is it about learning a culture that you would like to I, I think the, the, the target operating model for the probation service very strongly wants to create a learning culture and but I, it's still not really clear to me what that actually you know that's a, a big aspiration so what do you do about that how do you enable that to happen? yeah 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 so who does that absolutely right um I, I just have a little check in my participants list if there are people. Yeah, Sarah, you've been mentioned, but you haven't been able to introduce yourself. Hi. Don't yes, you like so, to take the point? Yeah. Hi, yes, I'm very new to the sector, so this is more educational purposes for me. Right now, I've just started with Core Systems and I work for Sinead, so this is very interesting and I'm I'm learning a lot. So thank you, everyone. Okay. <laughs> I do actually have to leave in a few minutes, so um, um, good timing <laughs> getting me <Yeah>. there. <laughs> oh, very good. You've been able to join. So yes. uh, at least we get to know each other. So yes. thank you very much for joining. That's true. No yeah. problem. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much. Yeah. You, you, I would like to come in if that's okay. Yeah. Um, different protect, uh, uh, perspective to Sarah. Um, I think that... Uh, what interests me about this sort of network is that not only can it be uh, cross ju jurisdictions and international, but we should also uh, listen and learn from other disciplines. Um, at different points in my career, I was responsible for people that had a youth justice or a prisons or a police background. And it always struck me as being particularly important to be willing to learn from people who came from different parts of the criminal justice system. And one of the reasons that the network, I think, can be a healthy place to learn is because not only can you uh, learn from practice and from people with an academic uh, purpose in their work, but you can also learn from people from different disciplines. And I would like us to keep uh, the complexity of the, of the learning uh, high on our list of priorities. Uh, another component which uh, hasn't been mentioned uh, as it relates to learning is not necessarily to think only about professional uh, learning or training, but also the development of people uh, who have big responsibilities or might be in leadership roles. And a specific uh, demand uh, within uh, the criminal justice system is to ensure that leaders are developed in a way which doesn't narrow down their uh, horizons, but opens them up. And I think leadership skills and leader, leadership potential is something that every organisation has to attend to, or will have people who are not able to stand up to politicians, uh, hold their own in multidisciplinary environments, build effective partnerships. So those are two dimensions that I would like to add to the discussion. Yeah, thank you. A very important ones as well, I think, uh, John that um, perhaps we are quite easy focusing on. Um, yeah, bye, Sarah. Um, easy focus on the probation uh, workers um, as primary, um, well, point of learning, but, um, well, as um, uh, Ore was mentioned, um, culture of the organisation and... Um, um, therefore, as well, other members, staff members um, are also part of learning process. I think I've 
been able to ask everybody to introduce themselves, um, uh, uh, except for Vivian. I'm not sure, Vivian, if your camera is off, whether you would like to join in. And if not, then I'll just just mention myself as one of the contributors to this session. Yeah, can you um, hear me? Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, and thanks very much, Yup. And uh, first of all, apologies. Um, I was very late joining the session. I was traveling from another part of the country. And then when I arrived um, back home, uh, I had trouble actually getting into the seminar. But anyway, that's that's my problem. So I've been very, very late uh, joining, but I, I was really keen to hear what people had to say. And from what I've heard so far, um, a lot of what I've heard is is quite similar to the areas that that I, I have been and continue to be interested in um, from, from a range of perspectives. One is uh, having been the former head of the Irish Probation Service, um, and as somebody then who, uh, because of that, was involved in uh, recruiting and uh, retaining staff and trying to ensure that they uh, they were able to work in the in the most effective way possible. And now I'm at the other end. To some extent, I teach part time in Trinity College to social work students, um, and uh, I can relate, for example, a lot to what Rob Canton was saying about. Some, some of the issues uh, there. And one of the other points that I just wanted to make in, in terms of where I'm coming from and, and my interest is I'm also the chairman now of the Irish Association of Social Workers. And recently in Ireland, we've just completed a, a, a very small scale study of the issues in relation to recruitment and retention and so on of social workers across the whole sector in Ireland, and part of that includes probation. And one of the issues uh, that I that I'm very interested in, and that we were that we are considering following that that piece of research that we've just done, is how to build effective partnerships, not just between uh, academic institutions and organisations like the probation service who employ social workers, but there are other players very often involved certainly in in the Irish context like the registration bodies um uh you know and uh, also looking to employers not just in terms of employment but providing practice placements and what what does that experience end up being both for the organizations the practice teachers and for the students so one of the, just to finish one of the main points we found from my point of view in that study was that very often the issues that are involved are things that people across the various different systems know about and recognize, but it's very difficult to figure out ways to bring people together, not just bring people together to consider the issues in relation to learning and training and development uh, and so on of uh, uh, workers, but how, how to make the appropriate changes so that the different parts of the different systems support each other uh, in in those endeavors. Um, and I think that people sometimes outside, outside the immediate systems that we're talking about in uh, insofar as we talk about academic institutions and then em employing organizations like the probation service, there are other players that and other elements uh, that we can and should and need to involve in order to make the situation as as effective as it should be. So I'll I'll stop there. I'm, I'm really interested in in hearing what people have to say, and I've been very um, struck by what I've heard so far. So thank you, you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Vivian, for your contribution as well. Um, I, I think I'll I'll be the one to 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 finish this first introduction of everybody, which well already takes us through the hour of of this. Um, um, this session, um, if I haven't forgotten anybody, so please um, excuse me if, uh, and please uh, uh, call upon me to say, hey, you forgot me if I've forgotten anybody. But if not, um, my name is Joop Handraad, I'm from Utrecht University uh, of Applied Sciences, uh, and as I've already quite some time involved in anything that has to do with working with mandated clients, as we call it. So uh, that touches on uh, John's contribution of different disciplines uh, within the justice system, whether it be probation or prison or youth um, uh, youth care. 
uh, or forensic uh, psychiatric care. Um, and um, I, I relate very much to the topic of training versus learning. Uh, as I think learning is uh, one of the more, uh, well, for me at least, more interesting parts. As, although I know that if people have to learn, sometimes you have to train them as well, to be able to, to sort of focus on a specific topic and uh, help them get along in this specific topic. And one of the specific topics that I'm currently working on is uh, to do with uh, the remarks that have been made already is online uh, learning. As um, I was, uh, well, coming across this for the prison services and online conversation training. Um, and what, what struck me was the gaming element and the, the idea of uh, games as possibility of getting people into learning. Um, learning on the way they build up conversations. And currently we're doing this um, with, uh, well, organizations within Holland as well, but also with some countries here in Europe. And what strikes me very much, um, and, and perhaps Jerry knows it because he, CEP has commissioned this, this first project on developing short scenarios for online conversation, um, is while building such a scenario for an online conversation, there's so much learning going on. There's so much reflection going on that it's very interesting to see how professionals bring to the table their personal expertise, their daily expertise, um, to sort of catch that in um, uh, an online conversation scenario that can then afterwards be used by people to play it. And again, to be reflective on choices that you make going through the conversation and the effects that it has on, on your interaction with the virtual um, agent on the other, or the virtual client on the other side. So in, in the sense of learning, I think um, the whole aspect of online learning is a very interesting field to see how it can engage people to resolve, well, questions, problems, um, as one of you was telling about uh, the um, uh, virtual learning, um, how it is a safe area actually to try to do things uh, and to know if, if, well, if you take options that might turn out to be differently, that uh, you can go back uh, without causing any damage. Uh, so I think this, this whole idea of how does it help uh, the learning process is a very interesting one. And um, well, Charlie, I'm very interested as well to, to see um, how it goes about uh, the online learning in, in all different um, people who are dealing with it or working with it. Excuse me for my English, not always as perfect as it should be, but um, I'm trying to express myself. Um, I think we will move on to uh, a, a second. Um, there have been drawn a number of questions for this meeting um, and um, well we scheduled it for two hours I'm not sure if people sort of because it's always a bit of the challenge with online um, if it's uh, you'd like to have a small break um, and it's difficult for me to see if people not or not um, I only see a few people so I don't see any people yeah I think keep going, uh, you. Yeah, and I if people so. and if people want to um, take a break and make a coffee, they can switch off their camera and slip away and come back. That's a very good suggestion. Thank you, John. Um, and and one of the other um, things that uh, is on the agenda is it's not just the why that you've been introducing, um, but also how will the platform be able to. Um, um, to, to help us in um, um, bringing this why we are coming to the table a bit further. Um, and, um, um, well, one of the questions I, I would like to put on the table is, is how the INCA um, um, is helping you so far, or what are your ideas about how it might help us um, uh, for the near future to 
um, uh, to, to get, uh, well, what is it that we're expecting actually, uh, how we could work together. John, if you've got anything to add, please do, huh? Yeah, uh, well, let, let me start off um, by a quick point and then people can uh, say what they think. Um, one of the things that a virtual network like IMCJ can do is it can move very quickly. Um, one of the good impacts of the pandemic, particularly helpful to international work, is it got us all much more used to doing things online than happened before. So we don't have to wait to get onto airplanes and go off to meetings that have to be planned long in advance. And um, the idea, I think, that has most benefited uh, me by being part of IMCJ has uh, been involved in a nine university uh, project, which is called the Action and Research Project, where uh, universities from uh, America through to Australia have been involved in uh, thinking about how to uh, develop a community of, of, of academics. Now, this meeting is part of, is one of the core interest groups uh, of that partnership. And um, it didn't exist 12 months ago, that partnership. So can you see how fast it can move to create a community of interest? And that's, I think, how INCJ can operate, uh, informally, fast, and using the internet in a, in a flexible and interesting way. So that's my start to contribution. You. Thank you, John. So um, please contribute. And what do you think um, that might be helpful uh, as um, this round table might sort of prosper or develop itself? Um, what are your expectations, ideas, uh, wishes? I know that some people have turned off the camera, so I'm not sure if everybody's heard me so far. Yeah, I, I can I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear okay. Me? okay. Um, as for me, I think the networking opportunity that this group provides is is something that is of benefit to all members. And um, like I said, there is a huge opportunity for training in my country. And this is an opportunity for me to, to learn from members of this forum. And some of what I'm learning or hearing to skill onto uh, my own context here. While, while my networking opportunity with you provides the great opportunity for us down here to be able to look for resource person when there is when the need arise. So so that just and and, and and is there anything more um in particular that you say, oh well, I would be grateful if in the next two or three coming months, um, you know. Um, I could have this or contributed that or have exchanged such a thing or whatever. Yeah, for, 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 for now, uh, like I said, uh, we, we cannot bring in international expert now because we don't have the funding, but the networking has already provided the platform for us to have the, the opportunity of bringing international experts whenever the need arise. So is this also a point, Don John, that you're saying um, funding is, is, is certainly a topic that would be of interest for this platform, actually? 
Yeah. Okay. I see you not. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else who would like to put on the table in the sense of what is this new way of communicating, getting to know each other, networking, offering a possibility to, well, whatever you need? Can I just add in, I think the idea of networking requires a, a driver. It requires a certain engine because if it's left too loose, it actually, everybody waits, as we've had in this conversation, everyone waits for somebody else to speak and to, to create a dialogue, you need topics and teams and you need discussions. So you need fuel for that, for any network. And I think that's one of the things that the, the, this particular meeting and this particular group could do because I think it's one thing to have a network but the most important thing is to have a purpose and to have a, a theme which keeps the topics moving so I think you need leadership in in in, in a thing but a leadership which listens to the other members to to identify the priorities to identify the the the, the sequencing of work and to bring in a uh, interesting and provocative speakers to the group as well. So I think there is a certain uh, momentum required in any network. If it stands still, it collapses. And I think that's the risk. And I do think it's important to keep going. And that's based on experience that you do need that level of um, leadership and commitment and also a clear focus. But it has to be a common topics and teams that are of broad interest to a large number of people rather than a, a narrow interest. And I do, that's where I would very strongly agree with the idea of the multi-agency, multidisciplinary exchange. In other words, pushing the boundaries a little bit on what people do and testing out ideas. So that's what I would see as a way of making the forum, uh, making this forum and this discussion work. It's, but it is, it's not going to happen of its own accord. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. Um, but actually, I think you're saying as well that it, it needs a more concrete than suggestions of topics or whatever that would, might be put on the table. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It, it, it requires ideas and leadership because everybody is going to hesitate and wait till somebody else speaks first. And in the end, nobody speaks. Yeah. And I think that's the risk. And I think you either get um, led by somebody who's on a particular niche uh, or you let, or everything just goes radio silence. Yeah, yeah. Nothing worse than radio silence. <laughs> I, I might jump in there at that point, you, because I think that's a, a an interesting dynamic and I might just disagree with Jerry for a second, which is, which is actually, I think one of the benefits of using this is this, the turn taken and the listening through online uh, uh, meetings like this is so much superior than in-person meetings, I find. Uh, so if, it, it, it's a question of uh, who feels confident to be in the discussion and actually those getting used to those moments of silence and reflection so that people can gather their thoughts and we can use it with the chat and we can use other uh, similar methods at the same time that allow people, you know, the post-it note technique, if you like, to, to write down a contribution that you're not just looking for those people who always say the same things, if you like, because we're well experienced at doing that. And we have a possibility with the technology that we're using to investigate how that might make a difference in practice. But what the, the, the point that I kind of really wanted to, uh, to suggest was that I think I tend to find that um, if you, if you think too much about objectives and outcomes, that dries up the comp the conversation because you know you're not at work with this you're with a group of peers with a group of friends with a group of like-minded advocates for what the, the 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 things that you're interested in and it's the values and if you discuss the values and identify what people's value you know, concerns are that are value related about transformation about change then the conversation really does flow and people find what it is that they want to contribute and it is that kind of community development approach which about support and inclusivity and support and a range of voices but based around actually not necessarily based on people's experience 
and standing. But you know, we heard earlier that people feel they're new and they've not can't contribute in the same way. I think that's great. We want new people to come in to contribute because that's where the new ideas come from and the new the fresh perspectives. So I, I see this these kind of online sessions as being a, a really good facilitator of that. And the discussion's just been so great to listen to today. You know, as I, as I said earlier, I'm not an expert in in this area, but the quality of the conversation is really strong. Thank you, Rob. Um, can I, want, I just wanted to say something about, yeah. um, I think that the networking opportunity is really great um, to be part of the discussion. But also, I think that, well, for me, I, I was just interested in lots of what people were saying, and there might be an opportunity to work collaboratively with uh, other members of the network. Also, really, in terms of making a difference, so I was interested in what Jane was saying around who, who makes a decision about what the content of probation officer training, for example, um, we know how that is constructed, but how do we influence that? And, and it might be through conversations around this, within a forum like this will give us some ideas and opportunities to think about how we influence um, and have impact on the different areas that we're, we're all interested in, I think. So, yeah, I'm quite, I think it is good to have the silences and it's good to think about just the, having the conversation is really, really helpful and informative. Thank you, Ross. <clears throat> can I chip in something? Um, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I was just thinking, uh, we've, we've done quite a lot of online, um, online discussions. We find uh, the best format is where you have a, very, a fairly specific topic, something about training maybe in this case, and you invite maybe three or four people to give a five minute before the meeting to give a five minute input each onto it to start you off. And I think that sort of um, raises enough questions uh, to, to get everybody going, if you like. If, if you leave it very open, people don't know which way they're going. But if you get three people, and ideally, um, we, we used to deliberately always have a practitioner, a policymaker, and an academic. So you've got different perspectives and you get sort of five minutes from each of those. Um, and it's quite a discipline to condense down what you want to say about a big subject in five minutes, but it often works. And then you have a, a long discussion after that. And, and we find that um, you get people, people start off, you get the silences immediately after those three people have finished. But then within two minutes, everybody's at it. So, it's, so I, I just think you need that, that initial input to, uh, to, to get people thinking about a, a number of themes or strands. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. And Di, would you like to come in? Because you said you just mentioned something in the chat. Uh, yeah, it's the first yeah. time I've been, so I don't really want to take any more time up other than sort of saying, I just agree with what Mike's saying in terms of it would be good to know. Um, I'm quite a chatty talker uh, and I'm not a lurker, um, but in actual fact, I perhaps I misread the way that the uh, event was advertised. I understood that there would be like three people first given their sort of view. I think because there were named people, um, I thought there might be then themes that we could um, we would be contributing to. Like I said, I've not been to one of these events before, so I didn't know how um, it played out. But that had certainly worked for me, uh, Mike's suggestion. Keep me quiet as well. When if you knew me well, Mike, you'd... <laughs> you, could, you could be one of the one of the uh, the, the three people. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to come in here if I could. Um, INCJ has done lots of webinars uh, on a very similar model to what Mike has uh, proposed, where we've had two or three presenters and then an, an open forum. Uh, this is a different sort of conversation starter, everybody. So this is about seeing who's out there who wants to join in a conversation. And I think that uh, if we wanted to um, do a webinar, I think, 
uh, we, we certainly have that pattern and have done that for three seasons now. Uh, in fact, we've got one on motherhood uh, next week. So uh, do if you want to listen to Lucy Baldwin and three other presenters come to that. Uh, but this is about people uh, maybe developing a sense of community about skills and training. And I was taken uh, with the fact that, say, for example, Mike and Rob Canton uh, both have loads of experience and maybe different perceptions or perspectives on what the right questions to ask about effective training. Now, getting, for example, Mike and Roz and Rob into a room uh, and having a conversation about what is effective training would be a fantastic sort of conversation for the rest of us to, to listen to. And it may well be that out of today's discussion, there are five or six topics which would be good starting points for a discussion. But it, we're, we're not trying to replicate a university style seminar here. We're trying to start um, maybe a more relaxed, more adult, careful how I say that, style of conversation that can draw people into a network type of engagement. Now, I don't know whether that's helpful or not, um, but we can do webinars. This hub could set up a webinar, no problem. Uh, and it could be on a specific topic, brilliant. But what we're really doing is reaching out to see people with different roles and whether there's a, a methodology that could allow a community to develop. Mm. I can just say it's working because I'm, I've been having some one-to-one uh, -one conversations uh, while, while it's going on with, with people. Um, <laughs> so hopefully everybody else is doing that and I'm beginning yeah. to make individual one-to-one -one or two-to-three contact as well. So that's fine, yeah. That, that, that's, that, that's, that's very much the idea, idea Mike. And, uh, and you know how, I mean, I've been part of, formal organizations all my life where you wait till the next agenda to make a point or you wait two months for the for the for the meeting to to, to arrive and everyone jumps on a train and goes to london yeah. this construct is much more flexible but I, i'll stop because i see that steve pitts has his hand up you yeah thank you steve come in please yeah thanks very much um <laughs> I mean, I, I, I agree with so many points. And just to pick up on, on John's there and also Mike's. Um, and about topics, I, I guess we, I mean, we, we began to introduce some of what matters to each of us in the first, the first round of um, conversations. And um, probably there will be overlaps and there will be some, some different priorities as well and some different you know, emphasis interests. Um, and for me, if I could just put one in and relate it to um, uh, something else, I think um, how how there are a lot of networks. I think that's that's perhaps the point I I want I want to make. There are a lot of different networks, um, and um, I, I I find so many of those very interesting. And I, looking at the kind of overlaps with the networks and find myself thinking, well, how, how, does the, the, how do the topics that we're beginning to talk about today, how do they relate to the work of other networks? Um, for example, networks in Asia um, that um, work on, working on probation, probation business and, and training and learning, um, or in Africa. And... Um, so I, I would kind of myself want to think of ways of linking out to, to other, other networks and making linkages with other parts of the world. And I suppose for me underpinning that, you know, the kind of um, not exactly the value base, but the, the reason why I, I want to do this kind of work is because I'm interested in promoting probation services and effective probation services. Training is an important part of that. Um, and, you know, help, helping to counter the increase that we still see in the number of people going um, mainly unnecessarily to, to prisons. So there's a kind of background, of course, so, so we're focusing on here, but there's a, a value base and a background that kind of drives me to be, to be involved. So that's just a 
a few thoughts for me. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. I think this is um, an important discussion and an interesting one on um, the position that um, Rob um, sort of put on the table and and was um, taken up by, um, by by some of you. I think that's an interesting one to have a um, a network that enables us to to exchange ideas. Um, and um, Mike, I think it's interesting as well that you say, um, oh yeah, um, already during this session, um, I could one-to-one -one conversations um, to see if you've got mutual interests um, that you could work on. Um, so, um, and on the other hand, there is the remark that uh, Jerry made, um, and, and perhaps I'm, I'm less of a, a community um, builder, uh, and perhaps, John, I'm too much of a classic ad academic um, format um, person um, to know as well that, that it can be helpful to focus on specific things. Um, so for me, um, I think that uh, a bit of a focus also helps me to um, know what I'm working on, although I do appreciate uh, having a network to, for reflection and discussion. So for me, it would be a bit of both, actually, um, I think, um, if, if I were to, um, to have a feeling that I'm getting into and getting connected to the network. I don't know if anybody else would like to comment on, on how we, we, well, their expectations or our ideas on... Um, um, on the network, or whether it's a moment for silence. Uh, you, you're missing Di, who's waving very hard. Oh, yeah. I'm missing her. Yeah, I'm sorry, Di. Please come in. Sorry, I'm waving digitally and actually mechanically. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's this, I've it's this try, man. trying not to speak business that I find really difficult. Uh, not to blow smoke up our own trumpet at DMU, but I was really interested in what we were talking about, about cross-pollination of networks, because I've been meaning to come to this network for, for quite a while. We started, it's quite embryonic um, at the moment, but we started a pro-academic network at... Firstly, it was DMU. It's got quite a few community justice probation people, but it's policing. So it's across the net across networks. There are now people joining because what you call a pracademic isn't just academics in practice. It's people in practice that may have um, got PhDs, but it's more than that. We would include um, students in that that are studying in any sort of criminal justice. And also experts by experience or people with uh, um, uh, offending careers, so to speak. Um, so if anybody is interested or if the network's interested in hearing um, from a pool of us, because there are a couple of people, I don't want to um, sort of out them, but there were a couple of people in the chat that have actually joined the network uh, fairly recently. So there might be something there in terms of, you know, I'm not touting for a double badge. But I think it would be really quite um, interesting to do. Um, so, you know, I'm quite interested in allied um, fields. So not just penal voluntary sector, but voluntary sector wider, because there's a whole load of stuff going on about that in all areas. Um, but I do think there's something there about um, nothing without us without nothing about us without us that would be quite an interesting parallel across the two anyway i've talked much more than i said i was going to and i'm going to turn my microphone off again now but it's been great i'm sorry i misunderstood the purpose of today i think it's i saw people's names and i thought all oh, these people are going to do a five minute ditty to get us uh, talking so i thought i'd rock up yeah. But, but do you feel comfortable uh, with the concept of, of being able to exchange not necessarily with a clear focus or is it that you feel more comfortable with um, 
well, then I'm hooking on on what John said, a more traditional um, uh, way of uh, putting uh, subjects at the table and, and trying to, well, uh, whatever, work them through or get alliances or whatever. <laughs> I don't think it's uncomfortable. I don't think I feel uncomfortable. I think it was just that it's the first time I've come. I've meant to come to one of these before. Um, it's the first time I've come to something. I think because I read the advert and there was people's names that I recognised that went to the network, I just made that assumption, oh, that's what's going to happen. Um, if I'd have been to others' presentations and seen the advert, perhaps the fact that you did mention in the advert as well that it was a round table, perhaps that would have leapt out of me. And I'd have just thought, oh, that's going to be like a different, yeah. That's a different format. So I get that you've got to try different formats uh, about different things because you don't just want to chalk and talk. Um, but it is about networking. And part of that is it's more interesting to listen than it is um, to talk. Can't believe I just said that. If anybody that knew me <laughs> knew that I said that. But it's like, but it is. It's it's I've been um mesmerized by some of what people have said. And that international. Um, has never been more important, um, you know. And we've we've got um, Zoom, and we've all learned as human beings. We've had to get onto tech to 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 connect. So you know, it feels to me like it's much easier to log on four to six. I'd rather be logging on four to six in the UK to do this than I would be battling the traffic back home from work. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a great way of doing things. Okay, thank you, thank you. And, and maybe we will discuss this while you're in the traffic uh, sometime uh, on your way back home. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of trying to figure out, um, because different uh, ways of going about have been put on the table actually. Um, and and John and, and Rob, you both made, uh, I think, a very clear statement on, on the fact that um, uh, community building is also about uh, trying to figure out um, while meeting each other how you would like to go about. But um, I'm sort of looking at uh, what the next step in our current conversation could be. Well, my view is that um the best conversations are ones just like Di said where you both talk and listen hmm. and um in incj um we will play back the tape from uh this uh meeting this round table and i'm going to guess that there must be 25 different angles, different topics that people have raised as being important to them as to why yep. a network could develop. Now, I might have underestimated, there might be 50 if we listen with a discerning ear to, mm -hmm. to the tape. Now, those 50 topics, if we were you know, professors, we might say, oh, well, we'll run a, a, a program of lectures on it, but, but we're not. We're a mix of people who are working in international development or uh, in a probation service or in a university or in a learning environment of different places. And what I think we need to figure out is whether, um, uh, as, as Di was saying, maybe having different types of conversation, different types of learning opportunities would be the best way to explore that. And if we can get, um, let's say, five or six questions or five or six topics, some of which might be particularly amenable to Mike's model. Um, well, let's do let's do a webinar. Uh, for example, uh, how do we know about the effectiveness of probation training? That might be something that would be a rich topic. And we can get some expertise about uh, the efficacy uh, and effectiveness of different training mo models and, uh, and run a, a seminar on it. But I'm also really keen that we get different people able to talk across boundaries and across disciplines. And that needs us to be looser. 
and um, perhaps to, as Rob Watson said, um, allow more space. So um, my my next steps may be for four or five of us to listen to the tape and to see what specific issues, topics emerge from that and to create other opportunities for conversation and dialogue. So that's my, my next steps. But let's see yeah. other people who are still here and ask them what they would like to have next. You know, you're you're the you're the consumer of the discussion. What would you like next? If I can just jump in with uh, actually a small call to action. So I'll be posting up the video and the audio as a podcast and the video will go onto YouTube. So you can listen back to it. So that gives us a really fantastic resource to to listen back to. Uh, and that discussion, uh, you know, will be will 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 be around. Uh, the the small call to action that I have is is join the discussion list, and I've put it in the chat uh, so that we can carry on these conversations. We've set up the JISC mail system so that we can uh, uh, for the, for the, each of the hubs so that you can you can get engaged with these conversations. And I'm a believer in participative media, participative uh, development. So. It's only as active as the people who are willing to participate. So propose a topic. Uh, we can facilitate discussions like this and, and we can bring people together. There's loads of expertise out there. So it's, it's as I say, don't leave a good conversation in the room. Let's do it online and we can we can share it with everybody. And that's that that then shows what we're what we're actually doing in practice. <coughs> Can I just emphasise that when I suggested three people at the beginning, it was five minutes out each, that's 15 minutes out of two hours. So the, the rest of it is loose, uh, deliberately. It's just a way of starting you off, if you like. But maybe you start yourself off slowly if you leave it completely open and, and you get to the same place in the end. And I just... I just uh, a lot of the things we've done, it, it, it deliberately gets people with very different viewpoints as well, which is quite interesting, or coming from different worlds. Um, and and uh, that gets a, a bit of a debate going as well as a, as well as a conversation, um, you know, people with different views. So, but, um, I mean, it's, um, there's so many different ways of doing it. And one, one, one way is to just let it happen organically, which, uh, which may, may be the best in the end. It depends how often you hold them and um, how often people attend and they get to know each other, then if you could have a conversation every week with the same group of people, roughly, you probably uh, get somewhere really interesting over a year. And like that. if you're doing it every three months, um, you probably need a more focused discussion. So I, I, it, it, it's, it's what the ultimate aim is um, of, of having a network, I suppose, that I'm, okay. I'm interested in. Yeah, uh, Mike. What I would say is that we can probably uh, fur um, furnish different types of discussion. Yeah. So y by using um, the website, we can do something that could be every day. Yeah. You could do something. You could do a podcast that could be every month, and you could do a webinar which is once every two months. So essentially, we're we're very flexible and. Um, that's the, the, the glory of being uh, having born in the, in, the, in the pandemic and being born online. Um, and, but I think that what this particular hub, it, it, its business is international and its focus is on skills development and training. Now, the learning uh, angle on that and the 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 importance of it being lifelong, and it's the importance of uh, uh, allowing people to grow in their understanding uh, means that different methodologies will actually appeal to different people, and that I also think is an exciting part of being in twenty twenty two rather than nineteen seventy five. I just want to add in a little bit about, because in a way I'm working in a parallel universe, because at the same time as we're talking about this network here, there's also a CEP network on education and training 
which is focused largely on the actual uh, training people within probation at this stage. And I think it's a good idea to try and talk to each other from time to time, but not necessarily duplicate each other. And I think that's it's about it's about finding a clear purpose for the particular meeting at a particular time. And I think I'd agree with you and Mike. I think that it's good to have a certain structure. It's good to have a certain driver in the discussion. And I think there's room then for discussion. But I think it's also about who do you want, who do you need around the table in the network for the discussion? And as I say, is it is it primarily an academic? Is it a ter- primarily a practitioner? Is it primarily trainers? Or is it a, about research into education? Is it about methodologies in education? Is it about exchanging models of education? Is it about exchanging experiences? And I think that's it's about having a clear purpose and then taking it from there because we can have varieties of discussion. And as Mike was saying, you can have different points of view within that which provokes more discussion. And I think that's about it, but it's about having a certain engine and a driver in the in in it and we need certain uh, you know leadership in that in that part of it but again what i'm saying is like i know for example that we will have a meeting in barcelona in uh, in on the 1st of july but we're we're targeting uh, people who are actually doing training in the various probation services across europe to try and create a sharing network among those as a first step and it made a to something further. Thank you, Jerry. Wow. Uh, and thank you, John and Rob. Um, I'm sort of trying to figure out if there are anybody else who would like to add something to what had been said. Um, or, or that you're sort of coming to a closure in the sense that um, well, uh, the idea of, of the table uh, is not yet defined, this, 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 this network, this hub, but there are different um, uh, ways to go about. And I think one of the essential things, at least, that has been said is uh, that the idea is, is that there are multiple ways, actually, to really organize this. Um, and that one of the suggestions is to have a certain um, more focus and, 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 and structure in, with the engine and the driver, as, as Jerry says, and as well the ability to have an open um, uh, possibility to have an open discussion uh, on topics. I, th- I do agree with you, John, that I think a lot have been said in the introduction, so that really put forward what people's interests are and, and, and what people would like uh, probably to uh, or, or might want to get or to contribute. And I think it's very useful to take some topics from uh, this conversation and put it again on the table and to see who would like to join in in either such a way of three presenters and then following a discussion or different ways um, that might be possible to um, join in. And I think one of the values, Rob, that has has been put on the table that I really would like uh, to stress is um, let's, let's be careful about who is contributing as well and that we're not going to be uh, too many or likewise people and are we going to get other people in? So that's that's um, uh, another interesting one. So perhaps bit by bit, um, some, um, how would we say, um, uh, form is, is getting into, um, into, this, um, into this hub. I think because of the time, if if anybody would like to add anything to this, then please feel free. But um, if not, Joseph, I see a little hand. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I um, already mentioned I'm a probation counselor, a practitioner, uh, and uh, so I'm so glad to see you. Uh, speaking, thinking, uh, be concerned even listening about uh, how you uh, and what you what you need to deliver to uh, to the practitioners too uh, and so i'm glad to to, to assist uh, this uh, academical process this discussion between you thank oh, you great great yeah thank you very much
Anybody else for a sort of last round? It almost sounds like a cafe, doesn't it? A pub. <laughs> doesn't seem like it does it so i think john is it fair to say that um uh, anybody of course who would like to listen back to this session and and give his headlights that that he would think would be uh, good to to have as a topic please um, do mail or or chat or whatever uh, send send your ideas about that uh, and if not um, uh, as well you probably or or me as well, I, I would like to listen back and well, make some notes as well, and to share and see the, whether these topics could be uh, a good follow-up for the next session. Uh, absolutely. Um, and uh, INCJ does run a, a fairly active program. Our two other hubs, one is on culture change, and the other is on... Uh, ICT, Information Communication Technology, after the pandemic. So um, you may well find that there are other uh, discussions, uh, communication things happening that interest you as well. Um, can I say thank you to you for steering us through this and keeping the conversation both lively and uh, friendly? We haven't fallen out. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> haven't. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, then thank you everybody for joining in and thank you as well, Rob, for um, um, facilitating all of this. Um, this is really helpful. And um, well, we'll get back to one another, I think. So, and please, if you have any suggestions for the topics, um, don't hesitate and let us know. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.